This guy's garage. Like and subscribe. Welcome, Minister. Um, I wanted to um, touch on a couple of the things that you uh, mentioned in your opening remarks in terms of your priorities. One of the priorities you mentioned was ensuring the veterans are remembered. And we obviously, the, the pinnacle of remembrance in this country, and it shouldn't be the only time we remember, but it is, it is the pinnacle of remembrance in this country, is November 11th on Remembrance Day. Um, and that's a time when thousands of Canadians gather to show their show their respects, to pay their respects to the to those who've given the ultimate sacrifice, to to show their support for our men and women in, uh, who have served and who continue to serve. Uh, and in those ceremonies, one of one of the key elements for many people um, is uh, is an element of prayer. Uh, and unfortunately, there has been a directive that's come out uh, under your government uh, on October 11th that's indicating uh, that Canadians will no longer be able to uh, engage in prayer uh, at public ceremonies such as Remembrance Day. Um, can you tell us what's behind that, uh, that decision that your government's made uh, and why are you telling Canadians that they don't have the right and the ability to, to pray for those who've fallen and uh, those who fought for this country? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Richards. It's great to see you. We sat on PROC together, I believe, several years ago, so always good to see you at this committee. I want to be extremely clear with respect to actually the question that was asked yesterday in the House of Commons, and I'll be frank, Mr. Richards, that question really took me by surprise and really left me shaking my head. I want to be very, very clear. There has been no directive that no prayer is allowed at Remembrance Day services uh, right. at all. I, I, sorry to interrupt, but uh, that is, in fact, inaccurate. Um, I have, in fact, the memo that was sent the directive that was sent out, if uh, the committee would like to give unanimous consent, I'd be happy to table that uh, directive. Uh, and it's, been, it's very clear that uh, it tells, it is indicating to their chaplains that they are, they are not to engage in, uh, in, th some, in prayer at, uh, at uh, our Remembrance Day ceremony. So I'd be happy to table that at committee. But uh, Mr. Richards, I, again, I, I disagree with you completely on that. Uh, we've actually looked into this matter, and it's very clear that we certainly want, that there was a directive that was given out by the chaplain general with respect to this situation, and it does not say that okay, prayer well, is not allowed at the Remembrance it, Day uh, ceremonies. It, it actually, quite, to the contrary, Mr. Clear. Mr. It makes Richards. it quite clear. Sixty-eight percent of Canadians identify themselves as religious, and uh, and fifty-four percent of them in indicate that it's it's incredibly important in their lives. And to be able to tell uh, people that uh, they wouldn't be able to uh, engage in that activity uh, at a public ceremony that honors our so soldiers is uh, is sad. And I would be happy to table that document with the committee. Uh, but let's let's move uh, then. Uh, seeing as you uh, aren't going to acknowledge that the existence of that directive, let's move to. Um, Another um, topic that you mentioned in your uh, opening remarks, uh, and that is uh, in terms of access to programs and services. And you've been minister for almost three months, I guess it is now. Um, I'm sure you've had the opportunity to, uh, to engage with some veterans, uh, to, to have discussions. Uh, and I'm wondering what, what you're hearing from veterans when you talk to them. Are they generally happy? Are they generally satisfied with the programs and services and with the quality of service they're receiving from, from Veterans Affairs? <clears throat> Yes, uh, thank you again. With respect to my uh, service, I've been appointed for almost three months now, and I've made it my priority, to be frank, to get out in the community from coast to coast to coast in order to meet with veterans and also to meet with stakeholders. It's really important for me to, to hear from them. My mother always told me, Jeanette, you have two ears and one mouth, so it's important to listen to folks on the ground, and I have a lot to learn from veterans and also from um, organizations that are serving veterans. Uh, I have to say the p feedback that I've received uh, has been, I've received some very positive feedback back with respect to services that veterans are receiving from Veterans Affairs Canada. But again, I think that we can always improve. And as I've indicated to individuals, if we don't hear the areas where, where perhaps that there are needs improvement, we can't make those changes. So you're telling me you're generally hearing positive, that you're not hearing a lot of veterans who have concerns about the quality of service? I have or, not said that, Mr. Richards. Okay. You're putting words in my okay. mouth. Okay, well then, is, uh, like, let's, uh, let's get to that then. Because um, one of the things that I'm that I'm uh, hearing often from veterans is um, about a real lack of trust that they have uh, with Veterans Affairs. And, and they, they tell us often that they're afraid to even speak up about their experiences um, because they're afraid that Veterans Affairs will retaliate against them and they'll lose benefits and services that they, might, that they may have now. Um, and so there's a real fear and a real lack of trust. And I'm wondering if you can, with your, from your conversations with veterans, if you can tell me why you think that lack of trust exists. 
Well, Mr. Richards, I think that we have to take a step back. And if we look at when individuals apply for benefits through Veterans Affairs, we certainly recognize that 80% of the, the people who apply for, for benefits through, through Veterans Affairs, and correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen uh, or Paul, uh, usually are approved um, on the first uh, during uh, their first application process. So Veterans Affairs Canada, when we are looking at approving claims, we want to approve these claims. The people that work at Veterans Affairs Canada want to be able to provide services okay. to veterans. Yeah, and, uh, I, and, I, and I'm sorry, Minister, but, you know, obviously we have our limited time here, so I, uh, but, you know, really what it comes down to, I guess, is um, veterans need to feel mm -hmm. that way. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not even disputing that that Veterans Affairs wants to provide that, but I think there's many veterans who don't feel that way. You often hear the, the term, you know, delay, deny, die. That's, that's a term that many veterans use. Uh, and that's kind of the feeling they have about what, what they're hearing from Veterans Affairs. So can you tell me why you think that lack of trust exists? And are you personally happy with the level of uh, qual uh, and quality of care that uh, veterans are receiving? Yes. In currently? 15 seconds, please. We don't have that yeah. much time. Mr. Please. Richards, I really truly believe that any department can always do better. And being the minister responsible for this file is, a, is, a, is an honor and a privilege. And my commitment to veterans, uh, if they are here today and listening, is that we certainly want to make any improvements that we can to make sure that they get the quality care that they deserve. Thank They've served this country you. and they deserve uh, to have quality service mm, from our thank department. Thank you. Thank you, minister. And now for six minutes. Even says in VAC's own publication, to come back on that, uh, sorry. And uh, donc nous allons donc commencer un deuxième tour. We will start our second round. The time allocated is different. For five minutes, please. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Minister, um, I want to come back to the trust issue, but first I just want to touch on one other thing. Um, do you believe that uh, the Persian Gulf War was in fact just that, a war? I certainly recognize that it is was a mission that our members mm -hmm. took part in. But do you consider it a war? Again, I'm not the person, uh, Mr. Richards, to, def to define if it's a war or not. I think we recognize that the Department of D&D &D is the one that makes the definition between war and special operations. What's your personal opinion? Do you, would you call it a war? I think that all members that are serving in the Canadian Armed Forces uh, are sacrificing a lot for freedoms around the world. Okay. And I think that all of that service must be recognized and commemorated and honored. We thank, we should thank them and honor them for all the work that they've done. Okay. And again, I, I want to add, um, I have several members that are serving in the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, I take their service very, very seriously. Okay. Well, we sure appreciate that, but I think there's many uh, members uh, who served in this, in, in our Armed Forces, who served in that, in that war, and I will call it that, a war. Um, who feel like they aren't properly recognized because it's not considered wartime service. And it even says in VAC's own publications that it was the Persian Gulf War, but yet they're not recognized as having served as wartime service. And uh, that leaves uh, many of our veterans feeling like um, they aren't considered the same way that they, sh they deserve to be. So I hope you'll give that some consideration as we go forward. Let's go back to this trust issue. Um, Ms. Blaney mentioned Philip Brooks, who's here with us today, and he's uh, one example of many people uh, who I've heard from uh, in terms of veterans who are feeling um, they've lost faith in Veterans Affairs. They've lost trust in Veterans Affairs to the point where you know they're being asked to provide proof for medical conditions that are in many cases lifelong conditions. And they're being asked to provide this proof over and over and over again. Uh, and it leaves them to the point where they just, they just don't know what to do anymore. Philip is on a hunger strike now because of this situation. Uh, and he's certainly far from the only one, unfortunately, that it is feeling this way. Um, they just, you know, it's, it, there's changes, policy changes, there's procedure changes, and it causes them to have to go through and relive uh, what can be pretty traumatic experiences they may have been through that have led them to having these lifelong conditions. And they have to prove these things over and over and over again. It's heartbreaking. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can uh, address this. I wonder if you could talk a little bit to this lack of faith, this lack of trust that many of these veterans have. I've brought it up previously, but I really hope you're, 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 you're um, taking this to heart. So can you tell us a little bit about why you think that, that trust exists and what can you do to fix that? 
Well, thanks again, again, Mr. Richards. And again, I, I'm going to start again by first of all indicating that we we have to recognize that 80% of our claims are approved immediately. However, there are 20% that, that of course will go to the review board. But I think we also have to keep in mind that there are some uh, complicated medical conditions and the case, the adjudicators have to first of all do their work to make sure that the condition is related to their service. Um, sometimes, yes, there's medical information sure, that's sorry, required, I, I, and that I, I doctors. I have to interrupt you there because what I'm talking about specifically here is, is situations where veterans have proven that they have demonstrated that, and they're being asked to do it over and over again simply because VAC has made changes to their to their providers or they've made changes to their procedures or their policies so these are these are individuals who have proven that this is a service related injury and they're being asked to prove it again and they're saying enough is enough we're tired of having to prove this over and over again we're tired of having to relive this situation it becomes humiliating to the point where they say I can't do this anymore and I'm not going to provide the proof again for the 17th time that's the kind of situation we're talking about here. That's what leads someone like Philip to be on a hunger strike. Minister, please, show us some compassion for these individuals. Tell us what you can do to fix this trust, to fix this lack of faith that veterans have in Veterans Affairs. What are you going to yeah, do specifically? What concrete measures are you going to me, take to, to fix it? Excuse me, I'd like to remind members of the committee, so if you have, uh, if you take two minutes to ask a question, you have to permit the, to the minister to have at least one minute and a half to respond and for now minister you only have one minute to respond to that so please be uh, casual <laughs> please go ahead thank you very much uh, mr president or mr chair uh, once again uh, mr richards there are processes that are in place uh, and sometimes the outcomes may not be exactly what the veterans or the applicants want. There's an appeal process that's in place for that matter. Uh, I think that at all times we need to be compassionate and we need to make sure that people receive the services that they need in a timely fashion. And we need well, to make Minister, sure that it's people... the processes themselves that these people feel have the concern with. It's the processes themselves. They're not getting point of, the point of order, to, yeah. to have okay, the compassion okay, that you're talking about. Sorry, so Mr. Richards, I have a point of what order. What do you about the processes? Sorry. Uh, Mr. Casey. Uh, Mr. Chair, you specifically directed Mr. Richards to allow the witness to be able to spend as much time answering the question as he spent posing it. He spent two minutes posing the question. He interrupted her after 12 seconds. So, yeah. Chair, just yeah. to respond to that point of order. Yes. Uh, we're, we're, we're given opportunity as members. We're given a block of five minutes to ask questions. And when a minister chooses to, to go down a path where they've either failed to understand the question or, yeah, they, but or, they're, I, or they're not addressing no, the question, but it's Mr. Richard, us I understand you, but... To uh, be able to, I, Mr. Chair, no, let me no, finish no. my intervention. No, 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 let, let's let see, let's see. No, I understand I'm, what I've you're saying. you respond to the point of order before Yeah, but rule, I, I understand Chair. because we have to go home we, because... We have veterans yeah, in this room who are I know, upset about I the know. processes. I just want to ask the minister about that question. I'm yeah. doing it on behalf of veterans, Chair. I understand that. We are on behalf of veterans and uh, it's televised. Uh, I know that. But like I said, if you, uh, if you take three minutes to ask a question, so you have to leave at least two minutes to the witnesses to answer your question. And, and stop and interrupt uh, the resentful intervention. So that's why I'm saying that. Point of order? About, Mr. yeah. Mr. Chair, point of order. Mm -hmm. um, I would, uh, could you point to where in the standing orders it indicates that it's required for someone to give the exact amount of time for the minister to answer a question as that's been <laughs> given to ask it? It's, the member has the opportunity to use that time to get answers, in this case on behalf of veterans who are upset about the processes, and I'm trying to ask the minister about those processes. Mr. Richards, let me tell you, you have five minutes to ask questions and to wait for the answers. If you want to take your five minutes, your total five minutes to comment or to say something, that's all. But as like I said, please do not interrupt. You not agree with the answer? I can understand that. But the witnesses should have the time to answer you. You know, please. So Agreed. now it's... Agreed, Chair. Let's, yeah, let's hear yeah, your answer yeah, to what yeah, he's going to do to fix those It's processes. okay. So, Minister, I only uh, want to give you only 30 seconds to reply if you wanted to. Point yeah. Yes. Point of order, Mr. Chair. His time is long gone. Through all the points of order, 
through his no, interventions no, no. throughout. His no. time is long. Yeah, on yeah. Mr. May, uh, Brian, May, listen, I have my corner right there, so I know. So um, that's my job. I'm doing that. So if I give 30 seconds to the minister, so that's what I'm allowed to. All right. So let's move on. And sorry to interrupt. So, Minister, please, if you have uh, any comments in 30 seconds, and after that you can come back and uh, another the round to go further. Please. Thank you so much again, Mr. Chair. Um, again, um, we certainly recognize, Mr. Richards, that not all clients are 100% satisfied with Veterans Affairs Canada. And that is why that we can always improve our processes. That is why that we have our ADMs that are working hard to make sure that when it comes to quality service and to making sure that the investments are made to make sure that that veterans do have access to the case managers, to their agents. Can you tell us specifically what you're doing to improve excuse the Excuse me, though. excuse me, sir. I just said that I give her 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Sure, it's not your job. No, you no it's not minister. my job. Your job I know, I know, rules. but I said that she had rules, 30 seconds, and between those 30 seconds, you interrupt again. So please, we have in front of veterans. We are working for them, so we need answers. Yeah. So... 10 exactly. seconds, 10 seconds, okay, the okay, now it's over.